Michelle. So hi, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. Like Michelle said, I am, uh, well, at least for the next week, a graduate student at the University of Memphis in the Earth Science Department. Um, I've got a bit of an unusual situation where I have been working um, in a bit of an interdisciplinary field. So I have been mixing little bits of GIS and archaeology and most recently um, education. And that's what kind of birthed this project. Um, the purpose of this project was to create a high school level introductions to the basics of human geography and a little bit of GIS as well. Um, so I would say that the number one goal of any teacher is to ensure genuine student understanding by utilizing very meaningful connections beyond the classroom. You know, this is what any teacher wants. We don't want to just have students uh, regurgitating what we tell them. We want the lessons that we're teaching them to mean something to them and for them to take it beyond uh, their time in school. So in social studies, it's a little bit easier for us. We're in the field of the human story. Uh, so I'd say we've got a little bit easier of a time connecting with students than say uh, the math teachers, but uh, we probably still have the same number of students falling asleep in our classes, sadly. Um, but since January, I have been working in the uh, in a high school social studies classroom as a full time student teacher under the University of Memphis. Um, and this is where I discovered that the social studies classroom is becoming increasingly interdisciplinary. Um, I was told when I got there that they don't have designated geography classes anymore. It has been uh, interwoven with world history. So that's the class that I have, well, classes that I've been working with this semester is ninth and 10th grade uh, standard world history and geography. So having my own personal background being history, anthropology, archaeology, and GIS, uh, I saw an opportunity to utilize my background as a teaching tool. So I was actually inspired uh, to do this project based on a story map, uh, one of Esri's story maps that I had seen a couple of years back. Um, and I wanted to create a case study lesson uh, where students could explore places of significance in Memphis, not only on a geographic axis, but also on a temporal one. So today I am happy to present with you or present you with um, peeling back the layers of time, a case study, which is a teacher made, well, a teacher in training made, a set of comprehensible case studies for student use in group work uh, in an in-class project scenario. So I wanna start with the lesson writing process uh, to give those of you that may be unfamiliar with the teacher process, some insight as to how uh, lessons like these are prepared. So in short, the two most important things of any lesson are having a clear objective and modifying your instruction so that it can reach as many students as possible. So having a clear objective is often aided by the guidance of standards, uh, or at the very least a curriculum. Now standards are usually going to be at the, uh, I would say the state, national, or even global scale, whereas a curriculum is going to be more uh, district or even on the individual school level. So for this lesson, I was guided primarily by uh, what is known as for the Tennessee Department of Education, social studies practice number six, uh, which is developing geographic awareness through a, a handful of methods, but I have picked three in particular that I felt were particularly relevant um, to guiding how I structured this lesson. Uh, so the first one is using the geographic perspective to analyze relationships at multiple scales. The second is analyzing locations, conditions, and connections to places uh, and using maps to investigate spatial associations among phenomena. And the third is uh, analyzing interactions between humans and the physical environment. Uh, furthermore, I also looked to the, uh, though our school in particular did not have a designated geography class, there are still world geography standards or standalone standards. And I use two of these as well. Uh, the first of which is world geography, just right off the bat, uh, standard number one, which is, um, and essentially the standards are goals that you wanna have students, you wanna be able to measure students' ability um, to, uh, you wanna check for their understanding in these. Uh, so world geography standard number one is to explain 
geography as a field of inquiry, differentiate between physical and human geography, describe the importance of spatial perspective, and use spatial thinking to analyze global issues. The second world geography standard I used was uh, having students describe the importance of geospatial technologies, such as GIS, and apply them in a relative, uh, relevant context. So the second part of creating a good lesson plan is uh, concerns lesson modification. Uh, and this is going to be known in the teaching sphere as differentiated instruction or the practice of appealing to various styles of learning uh, to reach as broad an audience of students as possible. Many of you are probably familiar with these even if you don't know it. Uh, the styles of learning that teachers are encouraged to cater to are uh, visual learners, auditory learners, or, and uh, finally, kinesthetic learners, but this is also known as uh, hands-on learners. So visual learners are arguably going to have the easiest time with geography, just because, uh, you know, given the highly visual nature of geography and GIS. But a question that arose during my uh, process of creating this project was, um, how do we cater to auditory and hands-on learners in such a visually rooted field? So for auditory learners, I have included a class length uh, introductory lecture. Additionally, with embedded uh, within the story map itself, there is a YouTube video uh, for those of you that have been in college or school recently. I'm sure you're familiar with John Green's Crash Course series. Uh, they just recent release, recently released a um, a geography series. So we have got the introductory lesson uh, embedded into the story map for students to be able to uh, come back to after the lecture and rewatch if they need a, um, a refresher on these introductory topics. Uh, in addition to those, uh, the lesson is also structured to be a group work lesson. So hearing your classmates talk about their ideas um, you know, kind of brainstorming with each other. This is also going to help appeal to those auditory learners. Now, the story map application from Esri does have a lot of hands-on opportunity, I believe. So using ArcGIS Online, uh, teachers have the opportunity to create basic interactive maps uh, using pre-made layers. Now, unfortunately, uh, my data was not compatible with ArcGIS Online for whatever reason. Uh, so I may do by creating maps uh, in, in ArcMap and then exporting them as JPEGs and then uploading them from there, as you will see when we actually go through uh, the project itself. So now that I've explained my educational framework, uh, I want to talk about my geographic and historic framework. So as I previously mentioned, I come from a multidisciplinary background and I wanted to bring that into the lesson. Uh, that being said, I chose to do a case study format for this lesson. Um, and have students work in groups to examine different locations around Memphis, uh, which have various reasons for being significant in our history. Now, this includes uh, the Pink Palace and the area surrounding it, Graceland and it, the area surrounding it, Beale Street, uh, Cotton Row, Meme and Shelby Forest, and T.O. Fuller State Park, which also includes uh, the C.H. Nash Museum at Chuckalisa. Now, each location is a place of both modern and historic significance. I chose these locations. They were prime candidates for demonstrating how uh, geography can reveal the hidden stories that are in plain sight around us. Using modern technology to peel back these layers of time and visualize stories using multiple sources of data uh, all in our backyard. So I categorize locations based on their peak significance. So if I scroll down a little here, um, you can see I've got the first layer, the second layer, and the third layer. So modern places such as the Pink Palace and Graceland go in the first layer with their modern significance being discussed before uh, diving into their historic beginnings. The second layer is going to be defined by places uh, whose legacy or rather their historic legacy is going to be a little bit more significant than their uh, modern day counterparts, I suppose you could say. And then the third layer is only going to have one location and it's based on both its historic and prehistoric uh, 
uh, historic legacy. So without further ado, I'm going to walk you through how this lesson would actually uh, play out using the story map application as the case study materials that the students would be using. So I've been showing you up into this point, just this first part of the uh, case study itself. So I'm going to switch my screen real quick to the lesson plan itself. And I wanna show you guys um, how this kind of comes together and how the planning process goes. So this is the lesson plan. And I assume Michelle would let me know if it wasn't working. So I'm going to assume everyone can see this or it will load shortly. Um, so to start off, thank you. <laughs> um, so right off the bat, we have lesson objectives here. This is what I was talking about when I uh, was referring to what is going to be guiding, um, you know, the materials for this lesson, and just generally what I want to see from students um, at, by the end of the lesson. So I wanted to have them at least in this section. This is going to be our measurable objectives. I wanted to have students be able to compare and contrast the same location depicted at two different significant time periods through the lens of human geography. I want students to be able to deduce how various forms of data can supplement each other to create a fuller picture. And I want students to be able to discuss observed phenomena rooted in available data. Now, these are what we call our immeasurable um, ob objectives. So this is more of a, uh, a goal that I can't necessarily measure a student's understanding through a uh, hard and fast assessment, but this is something that I would hope that the student themselves would be able to take home from this. So I would like for them to be able to perceive their own uh, spatial world and spatial data and historical layers. I would like for them to be able to appreciate how humanities and science-based disciplines can be fused to create new avenues for learning about the world we live in. And I would like for students to be able to understand various practical applications of basic GIS technology. So uh, the objectives here are generally going to be shaped by the standards, which I've already read to you all. So that's where these are listed. Um, coming down, we just have a general list of the materials. Um, and that's of course going to include the case study uh, story map that I'll be showing you shortly. Um, this is just explaining um, where I'm coming from and why this is important to teach the students outside of well the standards told me to this is the um, idea behind why this matters and what i would like for students to pull out of this beyond what i mentioned earlier um, so this is the what i would the, this is the bread and butter of the lesson plan this is the procedures and the timeline so the way that this lesson would begin um, is i would have students once class began, um, teachers often like to do something called a pre-assessment before they begin a new lesson. This is to get an idea of where students are at uh, before ever introducing a new concept, to see what they are bringing to the table themselves from their own experiences. So the idea would be that I would ask them, what is the longest you have ever lived in one place? How would you describe the place you lived? Um, and they would take a few minutes to answer this. Um, and once they had delivered these questions, um, we would talk about changes that they might have seen in their own neighborhood. Um, we would talk about change over time, what the neighborhood might have looked like before they arrived, uh, or if they lived there their whole lives, what it would have looked like before they were born, what it would look like afterwards. And this is where we actually um, would begin the lesson using the uh, story map. So I do have an outline here, but it essentially just mirrors what is seen uh, in the story map itself. So let me go ahead and switch back to the story map so I can show you all that. And we can just hop right into this and I can show you all what I have been working on this semester. Um, so I just wanted to brag on this a little bit. I, I thought this was a very cool piece of art. Uh, we've got the a historic map of Memphis in the back with the Memphis skyline. And I am a huge fan of all things that look antique. So I thought that was a great way to set the tone for the case study. Um, so we've got our title, of course, and um, uh, 
just a brief description of, it's a lesson of the importance of being aware of our heritage through the study of human geography. So the idea would be that students um, would be accessing this website through their own laptops. Um, now this introductory part, this wouldn't be something that they were necessarily uh, looking at while I was discussing it. The lecture that I have is based on the text that I have here, but it's not, it wouldn't just be me reading uh, straight off of this, though I will, uh, in theory, be using elements from it. So scrolling down, we do have this introductory section, um, talking just a general introduction to human geography, uh, differentiating it from uh, physical geography, and letting them know that this is going to be uh, the focus of this uh, lesson. Now, I do have a few pictures scattered throughout this first part that while I wasn't able to use it in the actual uh, data part of the um, in the data part of the story map, I, I did want to include them. I found some really cool old photos of historic Memphis in my research. Um, and so I did very much so uh, want to include those in some capacity in this project. Uh, so moving on, uh, again, this is just a very general introduction to the idea of, of human geography for these students. Um, and if I didn't mention earlier, I do apologize. Uh, I, have, I did mention that I've been working in the ninth and 10th grade classroom and that is what this, um, that is about the age that we are aiming with, with uh, this content is about that ninth, 10th grade level. Um, so this is also introducing them to the subject of the case study, which is going to be uh, Memphis, more generally speaking, Shelby County. Um, so scrolling down a bit, I've got another cool picture of the Memphis skyline. Now, something I really like about uh, the story maps as I was working with it is that you can uh, click on pictures and zoom into them. Though I wouldn't exactly call this a uh, super zoom or anything like that. You're not gonna see any super intricate detail, um, but you are able to just single it out and focus. And this is actually a, a huge part of the data analysis portion of the lesson is being able to zoom in and then be able to see it a little bit more clearly. So going down, um, we break down what comprises human geography. Um, I tell them that we often, you know, our minds go straight to maps when we think geography. But I also wanted to introduce them to the idea of uh, how data can express, uh, rather how data can have a spatial significance. If only, you know, we run it through we're very lucky to have technology today that can run these calculations for us instead of having to hand draw this stuff. So um, I did include a map that I found of uh, Memphis from 1888, but that's to lead into uh, the idea of using census data to study the history of a place. Now this did come from an idea that I had had previously where I wanted to incorporate more census data um, but I ran into a lot of difficulties with that, but I did want to include it in some capacity. So I had created this chart based on uh, census data that I had pulled from uh, the National uh, Census website um, about uh, uh, the most clear section that I had was the race data and how that has changed in Memphis going all the way back to 1850 and seeing how that has grown all the way up until 1990. And the idea here would be uh, to pull this up with students and to be and ask them, what do you think is happening here? Be, to be able to look at this and say, all right, well, if blue represents the white population of Memphis and orange represents the black population, and of course the others, we got gray representing indigenous, yellow representing Asian and light blue representing all other. So clearly we see a uh, predominance of white and uh, black in Memphis. And I would ask them what they thought was going on right about here. What story is this data telling us from 1970 to 1990? We see a drop off 
in the white population and a further drop off in 1990, with the black population continuing to grow rather steadily from 1920 forward. So while I don't have a uh, hard and fast answer for them, this would be something that I would call an open-ended discussion question, where we pose the question and have more of a uh, open forum discussion. Uh, it, it's what um, I know to be called uh, a Socratic seminar. So posing a question, having everyone ideally, if we you know get back to a classroom like normal next year, um, sitting in a circle, being able to talk to each other as peers rather than the teacher just lecturing, uh, you know, a one-way lecture. I personally am a fan of being able to talk to students, um, obviously not on a peer-to-peer -peer level, but being able to see how their minds work, being able to see, um, you know, how they uh, are processing this without my interference. So um, not to say that I wouldn't step in and correct them if it was, you know, incorrect in the sense of uh, just blatantly incorrect, but I do like granting students the freedom to kind of explore things on their own. So that would be kind of an introduction to analyzing uh, data, at least in this format. Though we do stick to a more uh, strictly geographic format in the actual uh, case studies. Um, and I like the ArcGIS, or ArcGIS, my goodness. Um, I like that Story Maps also includes an option to include links as buttons. So uh, I won't click this right now, but this leads to um, the Census Bureau's uh, website that gives a timeline of uh, Tennessee census history and uh, the history of the data itself, you know, where it is, where it came from, um, and even the history of just the census in Tennessee. So that would be uh, something I would include for perhaps more advanced students that might get through this a little quickly and might want to explore a little bit more. Um, so following that, uh, I discussed with students various different types of data that could be used to help tell the story of a place. Because obviously no one set of data is going to be all encompassing of a story of a place. So I discuss a little bit about economic data, health data, um, historic data, and political data. Um, and of course we've added here in the bottom archeological data and cultural data. I also included, because um, I realized political data, they might think, well, how do you map laws? And the first thing that came to mind for me was um, the history of redlining. So I included just a brief explanation here with a link to a more, um, a more full article that they could look at if they uh, desired. Maybe this would be something if we had extra time in class one day, we could uh, explore this a little bit. So you always wanna have those options as a teacher if you're short on time or if you uh, run over time. So scrolling down a little bit further, uh, this is the section where I start to touch on uh, GIS itself. And GIS is something that has been, uh, uh, oh, sorry, uh, GIS is something that has been uh, very personal to me. It's been something that I've been involved in on again, off again. Uh, as the University of Memphis, the archaeology department is very ingrained uh, in the earth sciences department and GIS just happened to be um, part of a lot of my archaeology classes and I grew to really become invested in it. And I wanted to include that not only as my own personal, uh, what I'm bringing to the table, but also because GIS is becoming an increasingly uh, I would say accessible tool for not only, you know, geography college students, but even high school students that are interested in geography, especially with ArcGIS Online. So I give them an example of just a very quick, I did this in probably, you know, 20 minutes. Uh, this is a map of recent earthquakes. So this is live data. And this is one of the reasons I really love the idea, excuse me, of story maps is because you can embed these maps with live data on them um, and show students uh, 
this is where the hands-on portion comes in. You can click around this map and it will tell you uh, an exact earthquake and it'll tell you what level it was. And I think this is just a very good example of um, just very basic yet accessible uh, GIS capabilities. And I've got a second uh, after I explain the concept of a thematic map. Um, I included a map that's going to be very relevant to students right now, a map with live coronavirus case uh, numbers based on counties in Tennessee. So if we were to click on um, Shelby County down here, it'll give us all sorts of data, uh, including, if we scroll down a little bit, positive tests, negative tests, total tests. And I thought this was a very relevant um, and applicable way to show students uh, just very basic GIS capabilities as far as the software itself goes. Um, then I wanted to talk to them a little bit about the technology of GIS. So I gave them a very brief explanation of aerial photography, but also LIDAR. Um, so I showed them an example, and this is the first instance that we have the slider function. Um, I will also say that the slider function uh, was the, basically the, I would say the, uh, not the whole reason I wanted to use story maps for this concept, but it was a big one. Um, I feel like the ability to just scroll back and forth, I don't know if it's, I'm sure it's plenty of people, but I uh, love this idea of being able to um, just, it, it's almost like overlaying transparencies and, and, and having stuff click that way. Um, so if it, you know, that's, that's something they taught, taught us in student teaching is if it clicks for you, it'll likely click for the students too. So use it, be creative in how you teach. Um, so here I've just got a digital terrain model versus a digital surface model showing students how LIDAR can reach all the way down to the ground, but can also scan buildings. And uh, this is actually just a uh, brief map I took of my own neighborhood. Um, so this is out in uh, Cordova out here. <laughs> um, but that's just a very general introduction to LIDAR. Again, this would be something that maybe we could come back to at a different point. Um, this lesson is just meant to be more of a general introduction exercise for them. Um, so now I would have them tie it all together. We would kind of sum up the first day. Uh, we would end the lecture by telling them that, uh, or rather posing the question to them, you know, what if would we do if we could discover if we could visualize the past using data like this. Um, and that's a general introduction to the exercise that they would be doing the following day. This is the video I included. So if any of you are in the teaching field or are tangential to education, uh, Crash Course has just released a geography uh, series and it's very good. So that's why I included it. Um, but also, you know, I'm not always going to be, I'm not around 24 seven for students. So this would be a great way if they're going over it that evening to be prepared for class the next day. You know, we all want those, those great overachievers who would do something like that. Um, but I did want to include this just as a general uh, reintroduction to everything that I had just discussed as this video, it's about 10 minutes long, um, but it, it touches on pretty much everything I had just uh, discussed. So then we get into the actual um, meat of the project itself. So with a regular case study uh, lesson, the way that that would look, say, you know, maybe 10 years ago, is teachers would have folders that contained uh, all manner of different materials. Um, so for example, if I, I wrote a case study lesson for my program, where I had students uh, looking at three different archaeological sites. And within each of those folders, I would include pictures of the site itself. I would include a brief write-up on the um, on the history of the location that was known. And I would include pictures of the artifacts. And the idea would be to have students work together in groups um, to synthesize the data and come up with a brief um, 
brief presentation, a brief write-up on what they felt uh, the story of this place was based on the little bits of data that they would actively synthesize together. So this is essentially a digital version of that with uh, six different locations that would be uh, distributed among the students. And each of them would only have to look at their individual um, their individual location, which would be assigned by the end of the first day. So I will go over um, just, I think I'll go over this first one right here, just for the sake of time, going over the Pink Palace Museum and its case study. And maybe we'll look at uh, one of the, uh, maybe one from the second layer as well. So the first layer, and this isn't the, the entirety of the first layer, um, the Pink Palace Museum is just the first one I had listed here. Uh, I felt that this was going to be a very good location to look at because of Clarence Saunders' history um, and his involvement with the area and bringing, uh, bringing a lot of money to the area at first. Uh, but of course, as uh, we local Memphians know, he went bankrupt and left the museum, well, which was intended to be his home, um, unfinished. Now, what was interesting to find out in my research is that this was the first natural history museum in Memphis um, after it was abandoned. So I wanted to see, and in fact, this was probably another one of the inspirations I had while working on this project, um, or rather before I started when we were still in the planning phases, was thinking about how the area around the Pink Palace had changed uh, because of Clarence Saunders' influence. You know, he had owned so much of that property. I wanted to see how the area around it had changed uh, looking at different forms of data. Now, in an ideal world, we would have, you know, just a plethora of different types of data that we would be able to examine this with, like I had discussed with the students earlier. Um, but the three types of data that I have um, for looking at these different uh, case studies is photographs, um, aerial photographs. So on, um, I guess, just like a regular landscape photograph, a an aerial photograph, and uh, I created some maps using residential data um, going all the way back to the 1800s. Um, hopefully that'll make a little bit more sense once I scroll down here. And of course, historical data as well, which is what this first part is. So in front of, uh, at the start of each of these cases, I have included a few photos for those for the visual learners. Um, but I've also included um, context, both modern and historical. Each site has its modern context uh, somewhere within the narrative. Now, whether I included it first or last uh, depended on which was more significant. So for the Pink Palace, most of us are going to be familiar with the modern context. Um, so I have just included what that is, you know, what is the Pink Palace for the few kids who have not gone on a field trip there, which, you know, after this year, uh, I feel like, you know, many kids probably haven't been, which is very, very sad to me. I love the Pink Palace. I love going to the Pink Palace now. Um, following the modern context, I follow it up with the history of the place to, and then this is the part that's going to talk about why it's significant to Memphis, how it changed Memphis, um, and then that's kind of the heart of all of this, is after reading about the history of a place, um, we want to look at the three different types of data and see if the data we have lines up with the history. Um, and that is part of these questions that I have right here before each set of data. So let me scroll down just a little bit more gently here. So this is a section that I have before each uh, set of data for each case study. Um, so I say below you will find different types and expressions of visual geographic data related to this location. The types of data included are photographs, aerial photographs, and maps showing when a piece of property was constructed. According to what we know about human geography, this data should visibly reflect the historical account you read above to a certain extent. Note that a lack of data is useful information too. What do you see happening in the data? What don't you see happening in the data? 
As you look through the below data, ask yourself the following questions. What sorts of changes do you see throughout the different types of given data? What changed and what stayed the same? Is there a particular period of time where uh, more changes visibly occurred than in others? Does the historical narrative account for this phenomenon or is it seemingly unrelated? On a scale of one to 10, how strongly do the changes in the given data correlate with the historical account for this area? Explain your answer. In general, which type of given data, photographs, aerial or residential maps, best demonstrates change over time in this area? And finally, if you could add a different type of data that we discussed earlier to this data set to better reflect the historical changes uh, you read about, which would you add and why? So this is the uh, this is the core of what the students are going to be interacting with. They are going to be answering these questions together in a group, looking at the data that I provide uh, for each location. Now, I included the part about um, the lack of data due to predominantly the second layer. Um, in the second layer, I mentioned earlier that I did, uh, I looked at Beale Street and I looked at Cotton Row. Now, this would have been an area, and this is, I should say, uh, a material that I plan on incorporating into my future classroom. Um, so I do want to flesh this out more than it is right now, but this would be, uh, for that second layer, a great opportunity to include uh, thematic maps of economic data. Um, but since I didn't have that at this time, um, they do look more bare than, say, compared to um, the Graceland area, the Pink Palace area, even the, uh, even the Shelby Forest area, um, surprisingly. So, you know, that would be an opportunity for students to think about. And then that's really what we want at the end of the day. We, we just want students to think, it, you know, whether or not they can tell me the dates, the exact dates of the Civil War or not, that's not what's important. What's important is they know how to think and they know how to critically think. And that's kind of my goal here as well, is I want them to be able to uh, think about what they're looking at, not just be able to tell me, um, oh, this is this, this is this. I want them to be able to explain themselves. So, you know, lack of data is data too. Um, so scrolling down, um, now this first photograph, um, I, a lot of these photographs I actually took myself. Um, so this was a historic photograph of the Pink Palace. And uh, this was from the 1930s. I believe I pulled this from, uh, I went to the Central Library and they had a very cool photographic collection um, of different shots from Memphis. And this was one of them that I found. Never mind, I take that back. I got this from the Pink Palace website, but there are some aerial photos that I got from the library. Now, when I went to the Pink Palace, I was very frustrated to find out that in the exact spot where this photo would have been taken, the exact distance and um, uh, angle that this photo was taken at, well, that is where the current uh, new building is. So luckily this is the only case like this, um, but this is a great example of how places change over time. Uh, is this is the new growth or the new building there and that would have been the angle that I needed to take this photograph of the Bing Palace. So I have got some better examples down here. So this is one I was particularly proud of. This is an aerial shot um, of the Pink Palace, which is right here, and Chickasaw Gardens uh, in the 1940s um, at a kind of an angle here. So what I did was I got onto Google Earth Pro and I tilted the camera. Now, unfortunately, we do still have to look at it on this uh, flat. I tried doing it with the 3D because it does have that function, um, but all the trees kind of got in the way of being able to look at <laughs> Uh, the houses themselves. And that's kind of what I want students to pull out of this, at least this photograph. We've got some actual top-down aerial photographs following this. Um, but you're still able to see a distinct bit of change where we see this open land here, which is again what I'm referring to when I say, you know, I guess you could say null data is still data. 
So residentially, all of this would be null. And you can see by 2018, we have a lot more going on in these areas. Now, like I said, this isn't the best example, but as we come down, um, we are able to see a much, much better, uh, better view. Now, these historical maps here, I pulled off of a website, um, and it's in the credits. I, I apologize that I can't name it off the top of my head, but it's a very interesting website that has compiled uh, some of the earliest uh, aerial photos and maps, well, mostly aerial photos of Shelby County. It's run by uh, the Shelby County government. Um, so I will uh, credit them at the end, uh, which we are running out of time here, so I will go quickly. So this is, I went decade by decade, or at least the most uh, where data was available for the aerial shots. And I have the slider here so the students could compare um, even, you know, 1938 to 1949. Now, in theory, the students would think, okay, what is happening between 1938 and 1949? What is going on that we read about? Was there anything significant that we read about or did the historical narrative not really have anything to do with that? So the students would be able to see the changes there on a very, um, uh, I guess, literal level, not really talking as much about um, the data itself. That comes a little bit later. but. I go through and I did, <coughs> excuse me, um, each decade, and I, I did try to go by decades here because I figured we're not going to see too much radical change between, you know, on a five-year period or um, anything shorter than 10 years. So I did decade by decade, and as I got into the upper years, I was able to find more resources like Google Maps if the imagery wasn't great. Um, and then finally, for e at the end of each section, I compare the oldest photo, the oldest aerial photo I have to the most recent aerial photo I have. So students are able to see the change over, you know, in this case, um, roughly 80 years, uh, 90 years actually. Um, now, following the aerial data, I've got one more type of data, which is the actual residential data. Um, now, the residential data that I had, it was very impressive. It went all the way back, in some cases, to the early uh, to the late 1800s. And the way I have this structured, and I will uh, open this up a little bit, is I wanted students to be able to compare, at first, just the amount of growth that we see per decade. So from 1911 to 1920, for example, um, <coughs> excuse me, grab a quick prank real quick. Goodness. Um, we see just a little bit of growth, but then in 1930 or 1920 to 1930, we see a, a decent amount more growth. So I want students to see the general growth rates um, per decade. Now, following each comparison of the decade, I included a map where I overlaid the two decades. So instead of seeing one or the other, you could see the first one that would then be overlaid by the second one. So that may, again, it may seem a little bit redundant, which I did consider when I was making these, but at the same time, if that helps a particular student, if it helps it click for them, then it's worth it. Uh, and that's kind of the philosophy I went into with this. Now, again, students would be able, in theory, to use these dates uh, to compare to the historical narrative and think, okay, is this particular, you know, period of history, should I be expecting to see something happen here? And that's kind of the thinking I want them to go through. Um, and then at the end of each section, I have a chloroplet map. Um, I believe that is what they are called. I apologize if that's not the correct term. But at the end, I've got a more comprehensive map um, so students can see, apologize if that's a little small, um, students can see all of the residential growth from the earliest record to the latest record. And perhaps this is more visually uh, comprehensible to another type of student. Um, and then that's something they very much so emphasize in, you know, teaching teachers is uh, you've got as many learning styles as you do students for the most part. And, you know, sometimes you, you got to teach something just the right way for it to click for a student. So I'm not uh, necessarily put off by the idea of including 
um, data just arranged in different ways, as long as it is truthful to, um, you know, the story is trying to tell, then I am happy with it. Um, I know I'm about to have to finish, but uh, just to kind of scroll through very quickly, I've also got Graceland here, um, as that is uh, historically significant to Memphis, as many of us know. Um, and we just included similar data, a couple of photographs, some aerial photos, uh, which I thought was very interesting. Um, and then in the second layer, we have got Beale Street, which again, these are the areas that probably would have benefited more from economic data, but that is something that I want students to kind of figure out on their own is, okay, well, we don't see a lot of residential growth here. Um, so what does that mean? Could we use a better type of data to explain the story of what happened around here? Um, and then finally, uh, also, I thought these photos were quite cool. And then I wish I do wish I had more time. Um, but this is published on uh, Esri on on the story map. So um, if you would like to look at it on your own time, it is available there. Um, but being able to look at the past so literally like this and then compare it to what we're going to see walking down the street, I, I would hope that this would uh, create a greater uh, appreciation for history because I know a lot of students are so so terribly bored um, by the notion of history and I would hope that this would make it a little bit more uh, real for them. Uh, Lord knows I was a late bloomer. I was not interested at all in history until I got to college. Um, and that's when it really came alive for me. And I owe that in part to uh, history or to, you know, GIS and the ability to do stuff like this and, and to look at maps and uh, especially in the field of archeology, span being able to see this stuff on through a whole new perspective. So um, I guess at this point, I will hand it back over to Michelle because Lord knows there, I, I could talk for another hour <laughs> given the chance. Um, and I do apologize if I skipped over anything, but hopefully you guys have, I can clear that up in uh, their questions. So. Uh, thank you guys very much for letting me present. I, again, apologize if it was a little haphazard, but there's a lot going on here. Um, and again, I could sit here and nerd out about this stuff all day. So if I can clarify anything, please let me know. Yeah. yeah so if you guys have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or unmute yourself. Oh yeah, let me check this chat that's been Ooh, I can breathe now, you guys. <laughs> um, let's see here. Uh, another source for population data is, ooh, thank you. Yeah, if you guys, um, if anyone that's still watching uh, has any sort of, because uh, has any sort of like data sources, um, this is definitely a project I want to carry with me into my teaching career. So I want to keep adding to this. So any sources, I would I would definitely greatly appreciate. Oh my goodness, let's see here. Lee Owens also said, also interesting in the census chart was the drop in white population in the 1880s, most likely due to the 1878 yellow fever epidemic and subsequent loss of the city charter. Mm -hmm. And see, that's also what makes it so interesting to me to look at charts and graphs. And I guess it's because I am a more a uh, visual learner, I'm a hands-on learner, not so much an auditory learner. I, uh, in school, I tended to just, just tone people out, but um, but yeah, it, it's always so interesting to look at charts like that and be like, ooh, oh, I wonder what happened here. So yeah, exactly, it likely was. And that, and that could be a great talking point of, if a student was to mention, oh, look at the drop here, what do we think happened? So, and you know, for every 10 students that are gonna fall asleep in your class, you do have that one good student that'll, that'll sit there and have conversation with you about this kind of stuff. So uh, it, it's very, you know, it's hit or miss, but the students that are interested, uh, I won't say they're my favorites, but. <laughs> uh, so Tom Lawrence said, great presentation. I really like how you were able to align the old and new photos. Did you have to do that by hand or is there a way to automate it? Yes, I, <laughs> that took a really long time of going into the snipping tool. 
on my PC and, you know, cropping things so that they would line up just perfectly. Um, yeah, it was really painstaking and really tedious. In fact, um, uploading each of these photos individually was quite tedious. So, so yes. <laughs> So I have a question, if no one else does. Um, yes, would you mind going back to the earthquake map? I saw that there was one in Tennessee. So yeah. I'm, I'm interested in what that was. Of course. Let me just scroll back up here. Let's see here. I think that is this one. Let me open it up. Oh, yeah, we do. Oh, I wonder if that's Real Foot Lake. Let's see here. We will find out. Um, oh, resolving host. It looks like I'm having a little bit of Wi-Fi. Well, at least the Wi-Fi issues it waited until I was done. They're they're polite that way. Um, but yeah, it looks like it's in the real foot area, which I'm sure most of us Tennesseans are aware that that is a very um, sensitive area. Of course, Memphis itself is a sensitive area too. Uh, earthquakes, but yeah, looks like we'll see. Normally, when I click over here, it gives me some data, but I guess it's at least it waited until the end to decide to act up. So, <laughs> with my luck, that would happen during my presentation. <laughs> um, yeah, let me see who's actually uh, got in here. I I do apologize, you guys. I'm a chicken, and I haven't been looking at who's actually in here. So, hi everyone. Yeah. Oh yes. A few people have dropped off. Um, we did have 15 people while you were presenting. Oh my goodness. Well, now that we only have uh, nine or so people in here, I'll, I'll be a little unprofessional and say, hi, mom. I know you're watching. Hi, Emily. You did wonderful. Thanks, I was so thanks. proud. Thank you, mother. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, thank you, Michelle. Thank you to uh, Magic for hosting me. Um, I appreciate that, uh, and and yeah. So, a week from now, I will be walking across that stage, and um, I wanted to thank you all for hosting me because this was the last little checkbox I had to check off. So, I do appreciate it. Thank you, Emily, for for uh, enlightening us. Was it was this your uh, capstone project? I mean, was this the the conclusion of your capstone project? Yes, um, so my capstone project, yeah, because I didn't add on the uh, education program until the um, until the end there, I was going to do something, uh, and Michelle is, is acutely aware, I actually was doing a thesis up until a certain point, and then I just, it, you know, it wasn't right for me. Um, so this is kind of the amalgamation of uh, everything I've done in grad school from GIS to history to education. Um, so it is kind of very personal uh, to me as, as well, yeah. Well, congratulations. Yes, thank you so much. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here, but I'm also happy it's done. So. Hey, Emily, I have a quick question about the, uh, the imagery. Yeah, sure. Yeah, your historical imagery advice, your uh, modern imagery, did you have to geo-reference it or was it plug and play? <laughs> um, if I tried for a little bit to geo reference some of the images that I had, um, and that turned into a much more tedious project than I had time for. So it really was this, I, I took the, the still tedious, but less tedious route of just cropping things until they fit until they lined up. Um, and also when I was going out and taking photographs myself, um, it was also just kind of spending uh, quite a quite a while trying to line up the perfect shot with my phone so that it would line up with that historical photo. Um, but the aerial shots that I did in Google in a uh, Google Pro or Google Maps Pro um, Google, or Google Earth Pro, excuse me, uh, that did take some finesse and, and finagling to get it just the right angle. So, right. Um, Thank you. Thank you for your question. <laughs> Let's see. I saw the chat also. Sorry, you guys. I have been using Microsoft Teams all year. 
Um, so, so this has been a quick learning experience for trying to uh, learn how to use Zoom. <laughs> um, but I have to say, I think I like it more. Yeah, I actually sent you a uh, network request over uh, LinkedIn because I'll be where you are in about in a few months. Okay, yes, I got your message. I'm so sorry. I've been so this whole semester, I've been teaching full time as well. So I've been wrapping up stuff at school, but I, I promise I will get to that. I am I'm very bad about responding to those in LinkedIn. So I will. No, no worries. I work for the, I'm the GIS coordinator for the fire department. So okay. oh, wow. <laughs> I, have a, I have a full plate every day. <laughs> Understood. Even on the weekends. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you for what you do. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. All right, so we've got about two more minutes. So if anyone has any more questions, now is the time to speak up. Yes. And if not, I will sit here and brag on Michelle, who was my office mate in grad school. And, you know, we would sit in the classroom and, and talk about, well, talk, whine, cry about our thesis. <laughs> Um, but she got me through a lot of, of tough stuff and I wouldn't be here without her. So I do want to thank her personally for getting me here in this, in this fancy suit and talking in front of all you impressive people. And so thank you, Michelle. Thank you. <laughs> I think Michelle is like the go-to person because I hit her up a few weeks ago about uh, getting my uh, drone license. She's it. She's where it's at. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You guys are gonna make me blush. <laughs> I think we need to end this now. <laughs> yeah, Michelle, you're a rock star. Thank you. Well, thank you again so much for hosting me, everyone. And thank you all for showing up who uh, decided to come. I really appreciate it. Yep, thank you for, for speaking with us. This is, I've, I've really enjoyed this. This has been awesome. So I am looking forward to playing more with your story map. I know I'm looking at it quite a bit already, but I'm really, in, I did not realize that the earthquake map was live so now i have to go back and play with that <laughs> so is the well i know it's a bit more depressing but the coronavirus map is also live so and, and probably won't i probably won't look at that one <laughs> so, all right but, thank you everybody and thank you for joining us today so have a great have a great rest of your day thanks guys Bye. Thank, thank you, you. all right